Well, I'll thank you, Eleonora, for this kind introduction. And I would like to thank Bay and uh, Eleonora and the organizers for the kind invitation. I'm delighted to be in Vienna, and hopefully I will today show you a couple of things that might be of interest to you and we'll do a good uh, introductory uh, talk for this wonderful track. Um, so before I start with the specific topic that I want to talk about, a few words about my lab at Cows, the Lab of Organic Bioelectronics. We deal with organic electronic materials, most of the time in the form of conjugate polymers. If you were in the plenary talk of, of today from Ant uh, um, Antonia Facchetti, you have heard about them. We really like looking at these materials because they have very interesting charge transport properties. Some of them can transport ionic charges in addition to electronic ones, and that makes them very useful for applications at the interface with biological systems that are in uh, electrolytes. And once we find some interesting candidates, then we leverage their properties for uh, biosensing applications in, in, in a variety of fields. And because today, you know, this conference is flexible and printed electronics, before moving to my in vitro system that's not very flexible and not at all printed, I want to show you a few examples of work that my group uh, does on, on the field of flexible and, and printed electronics. As I said, we like printing, uh, using inkjet printing uh, to um, uh, print conducting polymers, such as the one uh, that is known by almost all of you, PDAPSS on tattoo papers, then you can put these electrodes on, on the skin, which can then record um, electrophysiological signals. But doing the you know, connections of this to the acquisition system is very hard. For that, we also do some printing on, on textiles uh, that is then allowing us to bring these two systems together. So you wrap the textile around the electrode and you start doing some, uh, some uh, EMG measurements. If you don't want to use PDAP, there's another interesting 2D material that one can use for, um, for at the interface with biological systems. And this is Maxine, a 2D uh, material with very nice conductivity properties. We did inkjet printing of, of Maxine on um, PDOT substrates, substrates that, that, that is made of a self-standing PDOT. So you can print the Maxine in a completely water uh, dispersion on the substrate, then you can use this whole self-standing system, which just looks like this, a really flexible conducting. So everywhere is conducting. And in the inner part, you have the, the, the Maxine electrode. You could use this for electrophysiology or if you use some biofunctionalization units or just simply some recognition units such as an ion selective membrane or some antibodies tethered to Maxine, you can also start detecting signals uh, such as cations uh, from the sweat or uh, interferon gamma, a, a, um, an inflammatory um, a protein, uh, a protein that gives you an idea whether there's some inflammation in, in, in the body. You can also use inkjet printing and polymers to build glucose sensors uh, on uh, unconventional substrates that are not very unconventional for you, but paper is one. And you can make these sensors, this three electrode system made of PDAP PSS. So again, there are no metals involved in this. And you can even print the enzyme mediator, um, the dielectric, uh, as well as the uh, a repelling layer on these electrodes uh, so that you can make uh, glucose sensors that detect certain concentrations of level uh, of glucose in, in saliva. So these were all passive systems electrodes that I showed to you. And this is the type of work that my group does when we want to make a bit of yes and no type sensors that we are not very interested in the concentrations, but we want to know whether a, a glucose concentration is above a certain concentration or what is the EMG signals that you have. If you want to be more sensitive, you need to move towards um, obviously systems that are more active, devices that are more active, and these are transistors. And these conjugated polymers that do mix conduct, <laughs> that have mixed conductivity um, are very ideal materials for to build um, a, a particular type of transistor that's called the organic electrochemical transistor or in short, the OECT. So I don't know how many of you know about OECTs, but these are just very simple transistors. Obviously you have three contacts, the source and drain electrode. We coat the polymer, uh, we pattern it, uh, the conjugate polymer in the channel between source and drain. And we cover this with an electrolyte. So instead of a dielectric layer that you would have in pin pin transistors, we do have the electrolyte. And this electrolyte can be a, a phosphate buffer saline solution or any biological medium as well, like your saliva, tears, brain fluids, uh, sweat, whatever you name it. And here we have a third electrode. This is a gate electrode that is connected to the source. 
So the OECTs are the building block of the sensors that we build in the lab because they are able to transduce with very high transconductance the ionic biological signals that take place in this electrolyte into an electronic output. And how do they do this with very high uh, conductivity? Because the material that we use in the channel is able to uptake all the ions that are in the solution, obviously, which are pushed with, a, a, with the application of a gate voltage. And because the whole volume is involved in the charge generation process, you do have a very large drain current change when there's a small modulation of ionic fluxes in, in the solution. So this is why we are using these type of materials and this type of amplifier in our sensor applications. So OECTs are devices that convert, again, ionic signals into an electronic output. And because they are transistors, while they are doing this transduction process, they are also amplifying these very small signals. And we, um, uh, we benchmark the performance of, of these transistors by looking at their transconductance, which is the change in the drain current that we will get upon application of uh, a small field at the gate electrode. And typically these values are, are quite high, much higher than any other transistor technology of the same geometry. And that also rely on such uh, electrolytes. And this transconductance is a property that also scales with the film thickness. If you want to amplify signals even more, the only thing you need to do is just to increase the thickness of the film in the channel. And this is due to this volumetric capacitance property, this mixed volumetric ionic and electronic charge conduction that takes place in the channel. So this is the reason why we are using OECTs. Now let's look at how we typically fabricate them when we are not using printing. Uh, we use photolithography a, a, um, and a, a perylene peel-off technique to um, pattern the polymer film in the channel, which typically gives us dimensions at the order of 10 micrometers. So this is the length of this channel and, and it's about like 100 micrometer in, in, in size. And um, this is a typical example of uh, a, a transistor array. Here you have uh, six identical channels of 100 by uh, 10 micrometer uh, dimensions. You can use lateral gate electrodes to gate the OECT as well. So this can be your gate electrode, or you can insert the gate electrode from the top if you want the substrate, the, the transistor channel and the gate electrode to be separated. That gives you uh, a bit more uh, design flexibility, which I'm gonna show you why it's important. And here is the liquid that is uh, basically your dielectric that contains the ions, which will um, uh, make the transistor work. And another uh, example of uh, where we fabricate these devices. So this is a, a, a glass wafer. So they're here six channels um, gated by two lateral transistors and a very other devices that are identically uh, prepared in uh, using photolithography. And obviously you can make these all on uh, flexible substrate as well. Uh, perylene is one of the substrates that we use when we want to have conformable uh, transistor arrays. Now the, the potential of OECTs have been known for I think the past maybe 15 years uh, for biological interfacing. And I just highlight a few applications where they have been used and shown to be quite, quite efficient. Uh, so one technology, actually, this is the technology that, that kind of um, uh, hyped this, this technology is for detecting uh, in vivo uh, signals from, from neurons. Uh, in this example, um, in 2013, the OECT array was fabricated on a um, perylene substrate, which is conformable to the cortex of the rat. And this actually detects signals which with much higher signal to noise ratio than the um, uh, then the electrode arrays of the same uh, dimensions. In another application, you could coat, for instance, uh, uh, not coat, but grow cells on top of the channel, uh, or you can put lipid filers and monitor the, um, uh, the, the dignity, the integrity of the lipid filer or the cells so that you can do in vitro toxicology assays uh, using such transistors. And that's an application that my group likes uh, uh, dealing with a lot. And in a third application, if you functionalize either of these interfaces, but most probably the, the, the gate electrode with a biorecognition unit that is specific to an analyze, you can then start um, measuring signals from the channel that scales with the number of analyzes that bind to this uh, recognition unit. There's a very nice application of a similar device in here in the demonstration uh, from Eleonora uh, 
and, and uh, Luisa Torsi's group, the Simbit project, they're using a very similar architecture to detect proteins. And that's the application that I want to talk about today and how we are doing very sensitive protein detection. Why do we want to detect proteins? Well, I think I don't need to say much um, because COVID-19 happened. And before COVID-19, I was more interested in detecting nucleic acids, but COVID-19 has actually revealed a gap in our diagnostic toolbox. What did it do? It showed us in the early days of the pandemic, the only available tool that we had was RT-PCR. And as you by now are all experts in this, you know, RT-PCR is a great technique, mostly because of its sensitivity. You can go down to 13 octomolar of viral uh, RNA, but to get this RNA and the sensitivity, you need to break down the virus, extract the RNA. So you need a lot of reagents, sample processing infrastructure to be able to do these measurements. And that's the reason why RT-PCR results take, take quite a long time. And you can say that they are relatively expensive, or this was the case when we first started this study. Now, later on, I think um, in July 2020, uh, the first lateral flow assays came. So we call them antigen assays because what they detect is not the RNA, but it's the protein of the virus. And the protein of the virus, there are a few of them. One type is the spike protein, that is the protein around the virus. If you detect the spike protein, you don't need to kill the virus, you can just detect the live virus. If you want to be, um, if you want to kill the virus, there's another protein inside the virus, that's the end protein, and that's the thing that you can detect as well using these uh, type of letter flow assays. They are very fast, uh, 15 to 30 minutes, you get results. They are relatively cheap or cheaper than RT-PCR. They're not high throughput. Obviously you have like one sample at a time, uh, but they don't need any infrastructure, which is great. So we can do the, the test and then, and then you know, if you're negative, you're good to go to a conference or take the plane and everything. But the problem is their sensitivity is very low. So if you are at the beginning of your infection, None of these assays are going to uh, detect you. They cannot capture you. They cannot trace you. Therefore, we need a technique that is able to detect, I mean, nominally single molecule level or at least as high sensitivity as RT-PCR at a much faster time and without needing any um, infrastructure, no specialized lab, and ideally from non-processed samples to obviously speed up um, the work. And we thought OECD technology can uh, you know, do all of these things, if you manage to biofunctionalize one of the compartments of the OECT, one of the components of the OECT well, and this brought us the, the nanobody OECT, the nanobody con construct, which is a controlled molecular orientation of the biorecognition unit on the gate electrode of the OECT. And in this work, I collaborated with, with a, um, I call them protein wizards, uh, Professor Stefan Arold, uh, a protein chemist uh, and a biochemist, Dr. Wright Grimberg, who basically synthesized these type of uh, protein layers. So what they do, what, what we do differently is that, firstly, instead of using an antibody, which is very large, we do use a much smaller version of antibody, 10 times smaller in size, and these are called nanobodies. They're quite stable proteins, and this is specific to basically any protein that, that you want to detect. And in this case, we are going to detect SARS-CoV-1 spike protein, and this nanobody is expressed against SARS-CoV-1 spike protein. So the first thing is, again, the technology relies on the use of a small antibody that's called nanobody, and the second thing is, instead of anchoring directly the nanobody or the biorecognition unit on the surface, we want to have it as natural as possible. You want to have the nanobody floating around, you want it to be flexible. So you should not be putting it directly on the gate electrode surface. So for that, we uh, make these nanobodies, we express them already in the protein expression stage with a flexible amino acid linker connected to another protein that is called the spike catcher. So this is something known in bi biochemistry that this spike catcher unit makes a covalent bond to a peptide, a, a spike tech peptide. So there's a covalent bond between the spike catcher and the spike tech peptide. And what we put on the surface is actually the spike tech peptide. So we don't put this guy or that one, but there's another uh, peptide that we synthesize that contains maleimide groups uh, and which makes a maleimide coupling uh, with the chemical layer. This is the dithiohexanol uh, layer that is on the surface. So maybe this was too much biochemistry to get you back to the talk. So the nanobody is a small 
protein that we do not put directly to the surface. You see, this is my chemical layer, the self-assembled monolayer. I have a peptide that is connected to it that makes a covalent bonding. And I do covalently bind a spike catcher protein. Uh, there's a covalent bonding here. And through the spike catcher, I'm attaching the nanobody on the surface. So this allows me to have an oriented coupling of a chemically unmodified, a very natural uh, nanobody. And I think this is the part that is very important for the sensitivity of, of, of these sensors. Well, we do a few um, uh, characterization techniques to figure out how well we basically covered the gold electrode surface. I'm sure you're all familiar with these techniques. Uh, one is static voltammetry, the other one is electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, all tells us that at each step of functionalization, after the chemical layer, after the peptide, and then after the nanobody spike catcher complex, you do suppress basically the availability of the gold surface, meaning that you accumulate these protein layers on top. Uh, with a decrease of the uh, current and the cyclic voltammetry and an increase of the impedance, the charge transfer resistance uh, in the impedance um, uh, spectrum. And you can use also chemical techniques to probe, uh, and this is XPS that can look at the surface groups, and uh, we do see some signatures of each type of molecule that we put on the surface. But there's one characterization technique that I really like using, and, and the members of the group is also very happy to use. This is called the quartz crystal microbalance with dissipation monitoring, QCMD. I don't know if you're familiar, but this is a technique that, that basically uses an oscillating quartz crystal. And as you form these layers on top of the quartz crystal, uh, you change the oscillation frequency. Um, uh, so it becomes much smaller, uh, slower, the oscillations. And by doing some modeling, you can actually extract um, uh, the mass and the density of species that are accumulating on top of the quartz crystal. And that's what we do in real time with the QCMD. We are looking at the change in the frequency of, of our quartz crystal, the gold electrode, as we build these biological layers and that allows us to cal uh, calculate the number of species that are uh, formed on top of the, the, the gold electrode. And this is quite important because when you know the mass of the species that you have on your goals, and obviously you do know their molecular weight, you can calculate the amount of species, the amount of recognition units you have on the gold electrode surface. So in our case, that was quite a high amount of, of nanobody. That's 8.6, 10 to the power of, of 12 nanobody molecules per centimeter square of, of gold. Uh, to give you an idea like how big it is, uh, you can just look at this. Um, so this is about 20 nanometer, we are thinking. Now, if you put that many molecules on the surface, that means there's almost no space in between each nanobody. So the surface is completely like packed with the recognition units with a local surface concentration of 700 uh, micromolar. And again, I think for the success of Simbit's project, that was also one of the reasons why those sensors were able to detect, pick up very small signals, because you basically have a, a gold electrode surface that is dense with the recognition units. Now, the analytes no longer need to find diffuse around and need to find the recognition unit as soon as it is, it is coming uh, to the surface, it is just trapped there. Even if it moves due to dissociation, it will go and then rebind again to one of these recognition sites. And this is very important when you're doing bio uh, recognition units and build sensors um, that are relying on, on re recognition units. So this is my gate electrodes. And actually I forgot our gate electrodes are on Kapton. So they're also flexible. That's why they fit for this conference. Um, and the, the gold gate electrodes that is on Kapton, that's flexible, um, about 1.1 or 0. by 0. 0.8 uh, millimeter, uh, centimeters uh, uh, size. So they're also quite large, right? Compared to the channels. Um, we do incubate these with uh, a raw saliva sample. Um, sometimes we do one-on-one -on -one mix with, with a buffer. And we wait about 10 minutes, do an incubation. Afterwards, we are rinsing the gate electrodes. And this is a disposable part of my sensor. So this is like one sensor. What is not disposable is the expensive photolithographically produced uh, transistor base. So I have six channels that I can take current readout by using one sensor. And then once I'm done with this, because the electrolyte here is just PBS, right? So this is not exposed to the virus. We expect the virus to be bound here and do not dissociate hopefully to this electrolyte so that I can use this base after rinsing it once. 
And we just flip the, the gate electrode and start getting recordings. And this is how the virus and the spike protein looks like when it we hopefully uh, binds, or actually not really hopefully, I hope all of you are negative, but you know that, that's the situation uh, once the sample is positive. Now to make these sensors very, uh, to have very high gain, uh, we work with a, uh, with a, a chemistry group at, at Oxford at the time at, uh, at Taos uh, to make conjugated polymers that perform very well in the OACTs. We look for two properties. One is high stability and two is very high transconductance and especially a high subthreshold slope at low gate voltages because you do want to apply very small gate voltage uh, when you get the get the recordings, make the sensor work, and you want this to cause a very um, a steep change in the current, and this material is able to do uh, all of this that allows us to be, uh, allows us to have very high sensitivities. Now, this is a sensor, a, 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 a an OECT that is um, gated with a SARS-CoV-2 um, nanobody which is incubated with various concentrations of the spike protein spikes in a human saliva, a raw saliva we get, and then we, we basically generate various concentrations. You see that the, the shift is, is quite enormous um, in, the, uh, in the curves, in the transfer curves. And if you expose this nanobody gate to a, um, a non-target protein, that's the green fluorescent protein, for example, there's very low cross-contamination between the, the two things. Um, you just see the changes are, compared to this one, quite negligible. Now you can just take one current point and start plotting the change in the current as a function of protein concentrations in saliva. And then you do that, you see against GFP, we don't have much response. The sensor is not responding. Against MERS-CoV S1, this is another type of coronavirus that's very similar to the current coronavirus. But again, you're not specific to that because your nanobody is only specific to SARS-CoV-2 S1 the spike protein or its uh, receptor binding domain. That's a much smaller part of the spike protein. And, and, and this is the response that you're getting. Uh, <laughs> well, interestingly, because of this, you can't really see the concentrations, but you need to put in my words. So this is starting at 10 to the minus 20 molar. So nominally, there's nothing in that solution. And this is 10 to the minus uh, eight molar. And this is the detection limit of RT-PCR. This is about um, 20 optomolar. And as you see, the sensor starts wiggling and giving some current response to uh, concentrations of the protein and saliva, as well as, as optomolar concentration. So I can say about 100 optomolar is, is, is very well possible. But why, why is it so sensitive? I think I convinced you a little bit, but a bit of an idea about how these sensors work. So OECTs are nothing by, but two channel, uh, two interface, um, two capacitors separated with an electrolyte. So this is my gate electrode electrolyte, and this is my channel electrolyte. This is the electronic circuit where I'm recording. And this is my ionic circuit, the gate capacitance, the channel capacitance. Now, when I apply a gate source voltage, it is going to be distributed at these interfaces depending on the capacitances that I have. So this capacitance ratio is very important. Now, when I have binding that takes place at the gate electrode, the capacitance of the gate is changing as a function of the protein concentration. And now, because your transconductance is about 10 to the power of six Siemens, you are amplifying whatever capacitance change that is taking place at this interface with a huge change in the channel current because the distribution of the voltage is changing at those two interfaces. There's a bit more about it regarding the charge of the protein that, that you, uh, you have. So you also have changes in the electrochemical potential, but probably that's a topic of, of, uh, of another day. Now, the message that I want to give you, we have an oriented coupling of chemically unmodified nanobody at exceptionally high density. And that's really the key for this technology to work. But we also have a, quite a, a good high transconductance um, surface um, that allows us to give um, basically uh, this very low uh, concentrations and a very also broad dynamic uh, range. Now, we also test that very high the accuracy, um, the validity um, of these sensors uh, with actual patient uh, samples. So here I have about 24 samples. Some of them are negative, some of them are positive. They are nasal swabs as well as raw saliva, which is like really hard to work with uh, if you're not processing them. Uh, I don't recommend to anyone, but it's a good challenge to, to go through. Um, so here we are, we are looking uh, at the results and it all shows us that the sensor is able to detect the virus in unprocessed 
um, uh, samples within 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, uh, as fast as let your flow assays and their accuracy is, is very fine with the RT-PCR. And one thing that I forgot to mention as an additional uh, verification, we use um, for the same samples, we use a GFP modified, GFP nanobody modified gate as well. So you have an extra negative control that sets the threshold, right? And anything above this threshold is positive, anything below this threshold is, is negative. Now we took one of these samples that are positive and started diluting it down to challenge the sample a bit to see when we start seeing a signal. So you see, this is the, uh, the RT-PCR that's showing that the sample is positive, these are the RT-PCR numbers, and we are now diluting the sample about 10 to the power of four, and around here, 10 to the power of three, the um, uh, PCR could not detect any longer. It doesn't give a response, but the sensor does show something, and these three electrodes are giving more or less similar, uh, similar results. But this is not the end of the story because there's still a lot to, to improve. I wonder how many minutes do I have? Very good. Um, so there's one issue which the, with the HDT layers that, that we use. So if you want to keep the sensor, you know, you build all that nanobody layer, um, and you keep it for a while because maybe you don't want to test it right away, but you want to test it maybe in a week time. There's a difference in the stability, the, the, the response that you get in the first day and for a sample that is not that is not fresh. So we read some literature, that's a very good thing to go back. And then the literature shows that HTT is very sensitive to the, the ambient if you want to keep these layers for very long. So I don't know what's exactly happening, but we always find that this HTT layer is collapsing if we keep it for long in, in, uh, in, in PBS buffer. So then we thought, why don't we just get rid of this HTT and link the peptide directly on the gold electrode surface? So for this, we um, basically modified the peptide. This time we are using a peptide that has a 16 terminal that can make a direct chiral bond with the surface. And the good news is that this is a much faster one and easier one, as well as a solvent-free functionalization because HTT, you deposit it from ethanol, the peptide you can put it from, uh, from water. And these sensors are not only more stable over time, but they're also having lower background noise when you use different types of um, uh, uh, samples, such as even as disgusting and, and complex as, as, as wastewater. So lower background noise and quite a prolonged uh, shelf life. Now, one thing that I missed to tell you in the beginning, um, so do, the incubation step is typically the longest, the time limiting step for any type of sensors, because you basically need the analyte to come and find the surface, right? And to accelerate this, during the 10 minutes of incubation, we do a trick, we pipette the solution in and out to you know, induce manual mixing. But if you want to use these sensors in the field, that is an absolutely bad thing to do because that's gonna change the, the efficiency of your sensors. To make this step uh, more automized, we designed a new type of sensor. This time we are, you see, integrating a second electrode next to our functionalized gate electrode. Why do we do this? Because we are applying now an AC electrothermal flow in the solution that generates micro steering. <coughs> so when you apply the field, the, the thermal flow is, is generating these, these um, uh, uh, micro flows, which brings uh, the, the analyte to the surface. So this brings the detection to within uh, two minutes, as well as improving uh, the selectivity. It's also quite easy to uh, make different types of sensors if you generate nanobodies against other targets. So once you know the sequence, it takes about two months from the sensor uh, design uh, to uh, the sensors, which means we can now go ahead and do multiplex devices. And this is just an example that I want to share with you, I haven't published yet, so don't scoop us. Um, so this is a, a um, an array that we fabricated here. They're like gate electrodes with different sizes that allows us to have different sensitivities and broadness. And each color is representing a, uh, a sensor that is functionalized against MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV-2, and influenza virus. So multiplexing is, is very well possible uh, thanks to this homemade fluidics that uh, we integrated on the chip. So I hope I convinced you that OST technology is cool. Conjugated polymers are even better, but already Antonio uh, convinced you about that. High transconductance is important, but what's also more important is the, a good high density functional layer. And I think structural versatility of polymers and educated design selection will give us sensors with performance that is exceeding the state of the art. 
With this, I would like to thank all my group um, that are involved in this work, the chemistry, polymer chemistry team that we are working with, the protein chemistry team, the team that does simulations to understand that like high density um, uh, layer on the surface. And these are the hospital collaborators. I'm looking forward to your questions. I know that I exceeded my time, but Twitter. No, you are perfect. I'm perfect. Hey. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Thank you.